I'm going to focus on what I know more about, which is the CAD flows, and uh, especially in the last few years related to async sign-off. One of the recent, I think it's the AH100, that, so it's an 80 billion transistor chip, and this is, this is in our line that we would call GPUs, and from an async sign-off point of view, it's actually not the most complicated chips we do. The, those are generally the uh, SOCs, where the clock domain counts are much higher, the sources of IP are a lot more varied, we have a lot more uh, async reset domains and, um, and uh, even more clock domains. So those chips are, even though they might be a fifth or a seventh or something of the size of these, they're, they're actually quite a bit harder to sign off. Most of the flow is harder, but in particular these async flows are harder. So in, in one of the other things about our, uh, you know, being in a company with established flows and products and everything is that we're, the flows have to, you know, we're not creating a flow now. We have a flow that's existed for a long time and we're trying to modify that flow to make it better all the time. And, and while we're modifying it, it has to keep taping out chips seven, eight times a year. And, and there's a huge variety of designs, so these uh, numbers are just kind of general. Um, you know, we have designs that have almost no async resets. We have designs that are almost all async resets. Even a chip that has a lot of async logic is still 99% synchronous. And it's a good thing because, you know, that's much easier or, or predictable, dependable, to walk through a kind of straightforward ASIC flow and sign things off. You know, there's really no, at least from a metastability randomness point of view, there's, there's no uh, risk in, in the normal flows. If, if you are using single cycle sign-off, um, uh, you know, in a standard cell kind of flow, uh, just uh, however good a job you do of your RTL verification, your logic equivalence proves your net list are the same, your, as long as you meet single cycle timing. And so th those flows are very dependable and they work really well. Uh, for synchronous logic, but there's some, depending how you count it, you know, something a percent or something of the paths on the chip are asynchronous. It's very easy to make mistakes with asynchronous logic. A lot of the assumptions that people have about synchronous logic, things you just take for granted, aren't going to be true. And the first step that a lot of engineers, even even in NVIDIA, even uh, experienced engineers, design engineers, will think of async uh, sign-off as CDC sign-off, doing a good job with finding your CDC paths. Actually, you know, the CDC itself, by itself, you could get 100% coverage at that level and their chip still isn't going to work if you don't also meet all the things that are implied by that. How do we pass information back and forth between these flows so that we don't miss anything in our async timing coverage that we covered in CDC, so that all the assumptions are the same? And there's ultimately, um, like, so just kind of going through each of these blocks, boxes quickly, you know, there's standard RTL code generators that we'll use for, for clock domain crossings. And I, mean, I, I think, you know, doing that itself is probably eliminates 90% of the bugs and actually a lot of the really hard to find bugs. Some of the bugs that even our flows, as much as we've worked on them, would miss. Um, and it's one of the reasons we try so hard to force designers into using these standard uh, you know, there's no reason to reinvent a FIFO. We, it's, it's been designed well, and we've made mistakes in them, and now we can stop making those same mistakes. So, but, you know, there are, it's also evolving. Sometimes designers come up with new things, so, so our flows have to try to keep up with that. But I, it, it's almost in a left to right thing is how much bugs are being prevented in a flow, is use standard code generators. You know, there's a bunch of special cells that we have, the main ones are the standard cell synchronizers, so you know, not, not expecting to build synchronizers out of flops. Um, things like that. The, the RTL simulation with synchronizer randomization is something that we've been doing for as long as I remember. Um, but it, and it's constantly evolving and constantly getting better. So um, RTL, CDC, RDC, I'll talk more about RDC and assertion checks later. Um, we also downstream uh, you know, glitch checking, and then all, what I mentioned before about async timing. A another thing we have special flows for is the MTBF. I'm not, I'm not going to go into that, but essentially it's deciding that our synchronizers are deep enough. And w w if we have, 
you know, a million synchronizers or 500,000 synchronizers on a chip. Really, really rare events become fairly common um, when you have that many. So anyway, we have a lot of flows related to, to uh, verifying that across PVT. I was just going to talk specifically about Meridian CDC and RDC here. In the general, it's, it's better for someone to specify that something's stable than to waive something because they know it's stable. Is, you know, tell the tool the truth, let it analyze that and see that. And sometimes there's other side effects of that. And there's a lot of value to specifying it as a constraint. We can, the tool can sanity check it, uh, sort of do consistency checks. SimPortal and those kind of flows can help validate your uh, assumptions and simulation. So another kind of common thing, maybe a lot of people would do this um, for other reasons too, but is running at multiple hierarchy levels. So a lot of this is that, so, so we're building workflows that engineers, a designer is checking something, is doing their RTL. They want to get really quick feedback from that. We don't want to have a flow that waits until the chip's assembled to give them feedback. So we want to be able to run at whatever level they're they're doing their design at, so at, at very small unit levels. And, and then, you know, assemble those blocks as, as we go up to higher levels. There's also, you know, that kind of fits with the whole left shift mentality. Um, and uh, running, we, we do a lot of regressions, so we're running regressions. We're giving, uh, some, some flows I might say, like, I remember somebody asking me, when do you run CDC and who runs it? And I said, well, you know, designer runs it, the person running the regression, regressions run it, we run it in two different trees, the RTL tree, the PD tree. So the idea is, is it, it's all about, it still fits this whole left shift mentality, um, but it's not like when we left shift it, we stop running it on the right shift. We're still running it there. We're just trying to find the bugs earlier. We still run it because things get through. And, uh, and, there, and there's downstream things. There's DFT, there's ECOs, there's all kinds of things that can catch it. So. Another, uh, the multi-mode stuff is actually, you know, really helpful and really effective for a lot of things. It matches the way our constraints look in the back end, multi kind of clock propagation. But how do we get the right errors and warnings, violations to the right designer? These teams work on totally different schedules, They're, you know, when they sign things off, when. So giving them that control and also giving them the control just to look at the bugs that they could do anything about. There's kind of some general principles. I think that over time we've started to use more and more, and, and one of these is these sort of anchor points in the RTL. Uh, w once you have those, you can tie special simulation behavior to them. You can, a, a back-end team looking at a violation can see that it is on this anchor point, which they know existed in the, in the front end, so you can help deal with the noise by pointing them to the front end analysis of this issue. Was it waived in the front end? Why was it waived? Who waived it? Well, how does the back end know that? You know, we, we used to, and still do, communicate a lot of this through uh, emails and bug reports and things like that. But this is a way to tie it into the design. It's part of your RTL. It's part of your net list. You can tie it together. There, we can do coverage checkers. Was it run in the front end? N none of these lists are like a hundred things that you could look at. I'll, I'll, you know, if you have a million synchronizers on a chip, then, or you know, 8,000 FIFOs in a top-level block, you, you have to have automated means to, to gaining confidence. And, and an extension of that idea is really Meridian Sim Portal, which um, you know, kind of takes some of the things that we don't really have these anchor points so much for. Some, some of them we do, but and, and says, well, what are the, you know, why, why would a something that's past CDC? been signed off in a CDC check. A lot of, almost every flow I'm talking about here is, is something that passed CDC, why would it still fail? So we have to have some flow to stop these other reasons for things failing. And you know, one of them, kind of an obvious one, I guess, is if, if somebody says a signal stable, and we use that in CDC to propagate down and wipe out all kinds of warnings, and it's great, we you know, knocked out 20,000 warnings. What if that signal's not stable? You know, one person made that statement in a file in one place in one design review. So we can do more design reviews. That's one thing. You know, those are all two-edged swords. You're making people do more work, but on the other hand, you're uh, kind of reducing these single point of failure um, problems. SimPortal, the way we've kind of focused on it and, and been trying to uh, 
use it is, is really these kind of assumptions in CDC that are being used to, you know, if you say something's gray coded, well, that's a pretty easy thing to check. It's a way to tie that back. We're, we were already doing it with synchronizers, and I, like I said, these invariant points and all this, but this is a way to tie it specifically to a lot of the CDC, uh, the, the assumptions that we're using to waive things in CDC. So we've been doing uh, RDC-like checks for quite a while, but a lot of what we did in the past was a little more straight structural checks uh, or design rule type checks. And we evolved into wanting in, um, more of a, R, to treat our RDC tools and flows like we do CDC. So, um, and I, th this is sort of just the explanation of, you know, if, if you're not already familiar with it, kind of why async resets are, are dangerous. Um, and they've become a lot more dangerous because I think IP reuse, so things that used to be on their own chip, you, people thought, oh, power on reset. If I, if I get through power on reset, that's what, I, that's what I have to worry about. You know? But now you stick them on another chip, hook them together, do this with 1,000 IPs. You've got, you know, we, we don't, power on reset is, happens once, but a lot of these blocks are reset hundreds of times a second, you know, all over the chip. There's resets going on all the time. There's, for, for all different kind of reasons, and, and, and different chips have different reasons. So just in a nutshell, kind of why this is a dangerous thing is that, you know, if, if it was a power on reset, you don't worry so much about the assert edge. In fact, you're kind of coming up with it asserted. In, in a chip with hundreds of these little domains, the assert edge of reset is actually really dangerous, right? It, it, you assert it, all those flops are pushed into their state, but all, there's just a crazy explosion. Compared to CDC, there's a crazy explosion of asynchronous edges that are just everywhere in your design. Every flop is sending out these async edges. If they hit any downstream flop that's not already being, also being reset or clocked, or, and it's being clocked, you get more async edges. And, and ultimately, the danger is leaking out of your block that you intended to reset, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the, the problem statement, and then how do we and the picture is kind of showing two blocks that are, uh, you know, and, and how resets could leak from one to the other if you're only resetting one at a time. So, so you know, there's many ways to try to stop this. There's kind of the equivalent of, of power domain clamping. You could do with reset clamping. You could do reset sync sequencing. So maybe you don't have to worry about one of the directions in that diagram if, if you know which reset is, uh, is dominant, which one, you know, which one is always set while the other one is set. Um, you can stop clocks, so that's another thing uh, you know, that we use a lot. But, and, and you can change a lot of logic to sync reset. Uh, so, so all those things are fine, but as much, no matter how much that we do with that, we still need, you know, like they say, trust, or, you know, but verify. Like we try to make a, a dependable, trustworthy, um, correct by construction design, but then verify it. And so it, that's why we use uh, RDC flows. And, Meridian RDC is, we, it's sort of grown for us where we're using it much more now. In many cases, everywhere that we run CDC. Um, it's different because, you know, it, it's within a clock domain. So even something that you might not run CDC on, you could still want to run RDC on if you have multiple uh, reset domains. So these are the kind of bugs that we've actually, you know, a lot of these things we might find later. There's also a left shift thing going on here. We have downstream checkers where we might find these, but finding it early in RTL is, is better. And so these are the kind of things that, that are not, you know, uncommon for us to find. You know, finding these sort of uh, leaking uh, async paths and or coming out of blocks, or, or you can have race conditions between resets, what they're resetting. Um, and then late, late in a design cycle, you know, e ECOs and everything, finding, finding it early becomes quite valuable so we don't have to either miss it or, or not find it until the back end. I was going to wrap up with a few just, uh, I don't know, broad statements about, you know, things, how, how to not break a chip, at least from an async interface's point of view. So, and I've already said a lot of these, but just kind of re-emphasizing. Using standardized plugins, you know, there's really no reason to reinvent a lot of that. Doing as much as you can with simulation uh, for, for uh, 
that which is especially synchronizer models. Run CDC early and often and throughout the flow and through, throughout the schedules. So early when design is, da is the, our design data is maybe kind of dirty, things are not clean, can we run it? You know, how, how can we also run it late? More and more trying to uh, check the assumptions. So these are things that I've heard, you know, that I, I think are easy mistakes to make if you're used to a synchronous type of world. You know, one is people will say, well, it worked on the last chip, so it must be fine. And that, that's almost definitely not true for any async path. That's, that proves almost nothing to make that statement. It's like, it's like saying that you didn't have a hold problem at this voltage, so it must be okay. You know, it, 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 all, async paths might work and they might not work, but it, it, they're not going to work dependably unless you've check them. So being on a, you know, in the next chip, the delays change a little bit and the async paths won't work if you didn't check them. And that one we actually see quite a bit and I think it's because it, it isn't, it's pretty good for synchronous paths. Um, it's not a terrible statement for synchronous paths, but it's, it's uh, certainly a recipe for not working chips um, for async paths. Uh, another is, you know, sort of um, a glitch logic that I think in a synchronous world, people are used to the idea that if they can prove the netlist is the same as the RTL, that, that's it. They're, they're done, right? They're, there's nothing can be bad. And, and glitches are not a problem because with static timing, a glitch is resolved before the end of the cycle, so it's fine. You know, the, whether you have a glitch or not, it's, your chip still works. You know, those, those assumptions are not true here, neither one. The glitch can break your asynchronous logic, and your logic can be 100% logically equivalent, and you can still have it not work even though the RTL was fine. So another kind of related to that is, you know, kind of assuming that uh, if something's okay in netlist, it'll still be okay in, in layout. You know, and glitch is probably the prime example of that, but um, there, there's other things too, you know, if, it, or, or like an example might be if you check your uh, skew checks across various buses and things that in an early stage or in one PVT, does that mean it's okay in, in some other one? Um, you know, th those kind of assumptions, even in synchronous, are not always true now unless you're taking into account like cell versus wire delay variation and things like that. But, you know, you, you can pretty, you can come up with rules of thumb that'll work for that for... Uh, um, for synchronous paths a lot easier than async. We tend to just do async checks, I mean, if we can, across all the same corners that we're doing synchronous uh, time, async timing checks in the back end, um, and the MTBF ones that I mentioned. So there's certain parts of the async checking world that are across PVT, and I think that's it.